Why in the 21st century are we still fascinated with ancient Egypt? Well, it might be that ancient Egypt answers many questions that are unsolved, or at least can't. So many mysteries that are yet to be discovered. Well, today our guest needs no introduction, but we definitely honor him because if it wasn't for this man, most of us wouldn't be here doing what we do. Ancient aliens probably would never have happened. We have the best-selling author, Eric Von Dannegan, talking about his latest book, Confessions of an Egyptologist, Lost Libraries, Vanished Labyrinths, and the Astonishing Truth Under the Sequera Pyramids. This book is about his friend, Adele H., an Egyptologist who at 16 was trapped for days under the step of the pyramid. Well, let's not listen to me any longer. Let's bring on our special guest. I'm Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told. Please welcome to the Truth Be Told studios, the one and only Eric Von Dennigan. There he is. How are you, Eric? Well, I'm sitting in Switzerland. It's winter. It's really <laughs> cold at the moment, but I still love the country. And Switzerland is the best place in the world. Uh, you know, I've never been. I've always want to go, but uh, the pictures are always beautiful. The videos are just, you know, God God has been ble blessed, or Switzerland has been blessed by God because it's so gorgeous. Um, I can see why you live there. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. I, it's been about five years since you've been on the show, but like I said, you've been on many, 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 many shows over your over your lifetime. So, uh, but and and I'm honored to always have you on the show because you always bring such wealth of information to not just my audience but to the world. And I'm excited to talk about your brand new book, Confessions of an Egyptologist. And uh, I mean, how do you keep coming up with all these books and information? What And what was it like to put this book together about your friend? Well, you know, I write about an Egyptologist with the name of Adel, Adel H. In, in reality, his name was Adel Hamad. And uh, I knew him for a long, long time. Right. And he died uh, nearly 20 years ago. He was killed by terrorists in Egypt. Oh, no. And uh, I waited 20 years after his death, before I published quite some information which we had together. We have been sitting together sometimes night and days. We have been visiting the pyramids. We have been visiting Saqqara. We have been visiting all, all mysteries in Egypt together. <laughs> and he knew a lot because he was a professional Egyptologist. And what was, what's, what do you, what, writing about your friend, what was the significance of his story? Well, you know, he was Egypt Egyptian, uh -huh. but he speak fluently German oh. because he studied for six years at the university in Vienna. He studied Egyptology at the university in Vienna. So it was a pleasure for me. I could speak with him not only in English, mm -hmm. but also in German. And of course, I knew in some cases more than he knew concerning the <laughs> old books. You know, I read my Herodotus. I read my Platon. I read all the old writers. He didn't, but he was a local man. Right. He was the one who was climbing into the tunnels. He was the, the the one who was active in Egypt. I'm rather the man from the from the libraries, and he was the one, uh, but in practice. <laughs> and how did you two meet? You said. Well, he, I always every practically every two or three years, I guide a tourist uh, as a tourist guide people right. to Egypt. And of course, every a group in Egypt is also guided by a local Egyptologist. Right. And he was one of the local guides in, in Egypt for one of my tourist groups. And I asked him, was this coincidence? He said, no, he wanted, he has read in the office that Eric von Däniken would come. <laughs> and he knew two of my books. And he also, he told me he was a, a listener at the Auditorium Maximum at the University in Vienna when I had a speech. So he wanted to meet me in person. He thought, I am a fascinating figure, and he <laughs> wants to meet me. Well, what I found fascinating about this book, he was 16 years old, grave diving, and discovered a mysterious labyrinth. Was this a first, or was this something that was already discovered that, that was just not out to the public or did he actually discover it now he actually discovered it only uh, 
there was a British archaeologist. His name was Brian Emery. And I am not sure now, was he before uh, 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 my friend or, or later? It, Brian Emery discovered it under the, the ruins of Sakara, hmm. kilometers and kilometers of tunnels. And uh, uh, Adel was in these tunnels as a 16 years old boy. He oh was God. lost in these tunnels. <laughs> he could not find found an exit anymore. So he explained me quite in long, long time what, what his experience was down there. And what was his experience? Was I mean, did he have like a flashlight? Did he? Because I'm sure that it was pretty dark. <laughs> it was all really crazy. In the beginning, he had a flashlight because there was a small opening. You know, his father was outside. Right. And his father gave him this flashlight through this small opening. Later, they had no more energy for the flashlight, etc. Everything went wrong. And he arrived into a room. I mean, he told me in this room was a chair. Just a normal bloody <laughs> chair, nothing special. No writings, no hieroglyphs on the chair, nothing. And he simply sit on the chair. And at the moment that he was sitting on the chair, the room started to enlighten in a yellow light. Yellow, mm. not strong light, soft yellow light. The whole room was in yellow light. And he saw hieroglyphs as a 16 years old. He could not translate the hieroglyphs. He saw different gods, which... Oh. Some of them had seen in the school, in school, and he was absolutely fascinated. He could not explain where his light was coming from. I could not explain it either later. <laughs> did uh, did that uh, discovery ever get uh, open to the public? Yes, it was written about in some Egyptian newspapers, but the, the newspapers he did not t took very serious. Uh, they, uh, some of them said, well, it's the imagination of a 16-year-old. Wow. And so... Did you ever have an opportunity to go into this? Um, no, 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 unfortunately, never had. But you know, this sixteen-year-old boy, he was in these uh, subterranean caves, and he wandered for kilometers and kilometers because he was many hours down there. And when he finally came up to the daylight, he came up in Memphis. Now he <laughs> entered in Sakara, but when he came up in Memphis, between Memphis and Sakara are quite some kilometers, and he all wandered and and. In tunnels, you know, and and it was fascinating. At some time, he was he felt tired, right. and he felt very tired, and he, the day he wanted to sleep. So there was something like a couch, <laughs> and he simply sat down on this couch and start to sleep. And of a minute of another, somebody touched him. Oh and my he God! He told me, Eric, there was the most beautiful girl I have ever seen in my life. Although I was a sixteen-year-old, and the girl was practically naked. Oh, and as a 16-year-old, he never had seen a naked girl. Right. He was completely fascinated. Finally, this naked girl and he, he himself, the 16-year-old boy, they had sex in oh. this subterranean world. And uh, she left him with the, how you call this, what you wear on a your... Ne uh, a necklace? A, a necklace. She left him with his necklace. Then she disappeared like a ghost. And he was asking himself, was all this reality or not? And he's finally, yes, it was reality because I had my sex and I have my necklace. The necklace he brought up to, to, to the surface and showed it to his family and to other people. So it was all a very crazy story. So this this particular find, was it uh, based on one particular pharaoh or, or dynasty or whatever they... No, 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 they don't know. No, you could not know. It, it, he told me later that this underground world must be much, much older than official e Egyptology knows. Wow. You know, in official Egyptology, we know the pyramids, we know more or less the pharaohs, right. we know the dates, we know who, which pharaoh has constructed which building, etc. And in none of the old Egyptian hieroglyphs is something described of subterranean tunnels and subterranean tunnels of kilometers and kilometers. Hmm. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, two or 300 meters. It's kilometers of tunnels. And down there in these tunnels, there are hundred thousands of mummies. Oh, my For God. For example, two, 200,000 mummified crocodiles, over one million mummified birds. This is all completely crazy. You just have to imagine every bird is first uh, uh, put oil around the body. Right. Then you have to, to put linen in it. Then you have to put it in a, in a canopy, which is, uh, uh, anyhow, and then into the wall, <laughs> you know, millions. It, it's all crazy. 
Nobody understands it. Wow. Well, still, this, this is all still existing today, of course. A little part of these subterranean tunnels are open to the tunnel to the public in the meantime. One little part they call Seraphaeum. It's part of the tunnel system. The Seraphaeum is open to the public. And in there, you have a corridor as large you could drive in with, with, with the tractor, with, right. with the car. And then right and left niches. The, the, and in these niches, the most gigantic sarcophaguses which the world had ever seen. I, incredible sarcophaguses. And the, the Egyptologists who discovered that these sarcophaguses were absolutely sure they were made for, for bulls, the <laughs> holy bulls, the api bull. They opened it and or there was nothing inside, they were clean, or they found hundreds of broken bones, bone, broken bones of different animals in the sarcophagus covered with bitumen. So there's another mystery. You know, in Egypt, every form of life was mummified because right. they believed for a for, uh, reburn, that body has to be fully mummified. And now in this case, we find broken bones. What for? Well, I mean, I, why do you think, and I, like I said in my intro, do you think people are still so fascinated with ancient Egypt? Is there, it, do you feel like the ancient Egypt is the answer to our human species past? At least, yes, uh, some part of it. You know, Herodotus, the Greek historian, right. he was in Egypt roughly 450 BC. Right. And he was a long time together with priests. And the priests told him that the gods descended from the firmament 11,340 years ago. Hey, now Herodotus made this statement 2,500 years from now on. Right. So we have to add 2,500 to the 11, uh, 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 makes roughly 14,000 years wow. ago, the gods from the firmament have descended. And this was told to Herodot by the priests. Now, officially, Egyptologists say, come on, the, the history of Egypt starts roughly 3,000 BC, mm -hmm. but never 14,000 BC. So That's Egypt is time. much older than we all think. And this subterranean tunnel under Saqqara belongs to that older civilization. Of which we know nothing. I'm sure you've seen the article recently about the archaeologists discovering that lost 45 year, 4500 year old Egyptian sun temple. Have you seen that? The fifth no, dynasty. No, I have not seen that. No, well, I have not seen that. It was announced just a couple of days ago, and it said the fifth dynasty pharaohs built six structures until now, only two have been found. Um, huh? And and it's and it's showing that it's under some of the Pre, uh, uh, built temples now. So, how, do you feel that the Egypt that we know, you know, with Moses and the Cleopatra and all these pharaohs, were just a uh, ancestry of what uh, the previous uh, civilization was? Obviously, yes. Obviously, the previous civilization we have no name. Yeah, we have we have buildings. Look. The Great Pyramid, everyone knows I don't have to repeat the Great Pyramid. Officially, we have been told that the Pharaoh uh, Cheops, the two and a half thousand BC, was the constructor of the Great Pyramid. Now, in the meantime, practically every two years, archaeologists discover more rooms in the Great Pyramid and more channels, more little uh, channels which guide to these rooms. That means the planning for the Great Pyramid becomes complicated. Because before you construct the pyramid, the building, mm -hmm. and the rooms, and, and the holes in there, you have to plan it, some design it, some engineers have to sit down. But at Cheops' time, 2,500 BC, and don't forget Cheops' father, Snorfu, came directly from Stone Age. So at that time, they had no engineering. They had no planning at that time. Mm. So somebody else must have planned this building. Now... Old Arabian writers like Ibrahim Abdul al Masudi or al Makriti, they say the Great Pyramid was discovered, uh, was built before the Great Flood by a pharaoh with the name of Saurit. Hmm. And they precisely say Saurit is the same figure which the Hebrew community call Enoch. Now, hmm. everything is clear. 
Enoch for me is clear. He was a young man. He was taken away by the extraterrestrials. That's not my invention. He, he writes it down himself in the book of Enoch. They teach him their language. They learned him writing. They, in, they teach him in engineering. They teach him in astronomy and everything. And they brought him back to the planet Earth. And Enoch was the one who gave order to construct the pyramid. He made the planning. He was able to make the planning because he was the, uh, the, the student of the extraterrestrials. Right. But the humans made the pyramid, not the extraterrestrials. The human made all these, all these things. And why? Because in the pyramids, we should find all the books of Enoch. Hmm. Whatever he learned, what they have taught him is in the Great Pyramid, including some objects of the extraterrestrials. So I wait impatiently, but finally we open the pyramid. I hope, I hope, I hope in, in, in your lifetime that it does happen. I would love to see that. Um, so you can see the, the mysteries that we've been searching for for all these years. Uh, it's, what's funny is my, my seventh great-grandfather's name was Enoch Enox. <laughs> Oh, funny, really. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, so. I don't know how there is. A, maybe there's a connection down there somewhere. Um, but well, I, I heard that it took twenty years to build this pyramid. Uh, with, uh, but it that just seems impossible to me. Um, what What is your theory on the building of the pyramid itself, of how it Look, was built? Uh, two thousand years ago, and two thousand one or two or three hundred, all the historians which we know today, like. Theodorus, Strabon, Plutarch, they mm -hmm. all were in Egypt and they all stood before the Great Pyramid and they all asked the natives there who built the pyramid. And each and everyone, including the priests, said, we don't know because it was made before the Great Flood, except Herodotus, the Greek historian. And he, in his books, makes absolutely clear what he sees with the eyes, right. what he smells and what he knows from telling what somebody told him. And he writes in the second book of history, somebody told him, a pharaoh with the name of Khufu, Khufu is the Greek word for Cheops, right. constructed the pyramid within 20 years with the help of 100,000 slaves. Wow. So the name Cheops comes only from Herodotus. He's the only one who brings Cheops uh, and says, somebody told me. All the other historians say no. The old Egyptian did not know who, who made the pyramid. By the way, you know, Herodotus is uh, roughly 450 BC. Diodor of Sicily is more or less 600 years later after Herodotus. He knows the books of his presenter of Herodotus. And he says, no, my colleague, my writing colleague is wrong by saying Cheops did it because the old Egyptian do not know who did it. Now, for Cheops again, there is nobody who had planned the pyramid. There is no engineering knowledge in his time. So it makes it makes it very, very complicated. I really personally believe that the pyramid was constructed, as the old Arabian says, before the Great Flood, and that the content is there, the Book of Enoch's. What I find fascinating, how many, many temples or pyramids survive just environment when compared to many other things around the world that don't last you know 20 years let alone 14,000 or 10,000 or how how do you how has this survived so long if it was before the flood and I, if, if that's kind of a big mystery to me that's kind of a big mystery for me too obviously they work <laughs> with quality they had more quality than we have they use the stones from Aswan mostly, which is granite and, and uh, the sandstone they used only were on, on places where it was not important. So they had that sense of quality, which we miss today sometimes. <laughs> well, one thing back to the your, your friend Adele, you said there uh, there is all these tunnels. Yeah. And I, I'm I'm fascinated. I can understand if there was a temple and they have tunnels going down and, and they lay to rest something you know a, a pharaoh or crocodiles but why why the significance of the tunnels being so large so long is was there were they afraid of something to stay underneath the ground at a longer period of time because why would they have to build tunnels when they just go on land 
Well, that, that's a wonderful question and another mystery. Definitely, the old Egyptians, they knew that sometimes before their time, our planet was destroyed already once. And they were afraid that another destruction of the planet would come. So that the planet and all the living creatures on this planet would survive, they mummified every kind of, of form of life. They did not only mummify the human bodies, right. they mummified every kind, That's crocodiles, ducks, even fishes, scorpions, everything they mummified. Because their belief was that after the next destruction of the world, life would come back because uh -huh. of all these bodies were preserved, so they could be uh, reburned again. Now, the problem hmm. with the tunnel is they should have known that, for example, if the planet would be destroyed by water, the water would also destroy the tunnels. Yeah. So, yeah, they rather were afraid of a destruction like fire, uh. something hot, something coming from the cosmos, for example, from asteroids, something would come down from, from heaven, and this would not destroy the tunnels. That is rather that the things why they do it, because water would have, would have destroyed the tunnels too. Exactly. The fact, the fact is they made these tunnels. They are there. You can control this. And down there are millions, not ten thousands, millions of mummies, which is all crazy. It almost sounds like Noah's Ark when it comes to, you know how Noah's Ark put all these animals on a boat to, to save it from the flood. It's almost like we're going to put all these mummified uh, animals and people down there and once whatever this you know catastrophe is over we'll bring it you know whatever the gods will bring them back to life it's almost sounds like that this is a wonderful connection will you just you give me here i had the same thoughts in a way but it could really be because right. all kinds of animal exist down there right in the form of mummies it huh. all looks it remembers of noah's ark yes yeah that's pretty fascinating wow <laughs> Um, well, I know um, w when we get new discoveries, and it seems like you know every so often we get these new discoveries. What 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 are some of these new discoveries? And like I said, you haven't heard of the newest one, but when we find new discoveries, how come we don't find? Um, at least maybe the government doesn't let it. But how come we don't find more alien technology or alien existence when it comes to like even the previous? Uh, civilizations before the the pharaohs of Egypt um, that we know of. Well, the fact is, we never found an alien a a a artifact until today. I am still missing that. I have uh, <clears throat> in my forty-three books, I have given hundreds and hundreds of indications which support the case. <clears throat> yes, this planet was visited by beings from outer space, and I'm absolutely sure we were visited by beings from outer space. But I have not one proof in form of an artifact because we never found an extraterrestrial artifact. Now, the fact is, in some mythologies, these artifacts do exist and we even know where they are. Hmm. For example, in the Bible, you read the story of the Ark of the Covenant. Right. So the Ark of the Covenant was not a human object. It was an, an object from extraterrestrials. The inside of the Ark <clears throat> of the Covenant was not human. It hmm. was in the Old Testament, it was part of the Almighty God. Right. But today, we know where the Ark of the Government is, somewhere under a church in Ethiopia. But it's a holy place. You cannot go there. You cannot visit it. You cannot make analysis. You cannot photograph it. So we have an object, but we have no proof. We have no access to it. The same thing happened in Japan. You know, the Japanese, the Japanese first emperor, Jimu Tenno, mm -hmm. he said, his family came from the space. Hmm. So he was inseminated, his mother was inseminated by, by a space figure. That's why Japan, too, still today, their flag, they have the sun. Now, when Jim Uteno died, they, they uh, and by the way, Jim Uteno received from his heavenly father something like a mirror. Right. And in this mirror, he could see whatever happens in all these little islands in the Pacific uh, Ocean. Now, when he died, they mummified him. They put him in a sarcophagus. I mm. was there. And in the sarcophagus is also this mirror, this miraculous mirror. But nobody opens a sarcophagus because it's a holy place. It has to right. do with the uh, Shinto religion. So maybe we have some extraterrestrial artifacts. But because of the religion, we have no access to it. Wonderful. Wow. Um, 
Yeah, I uh, not too long ago I interviewed a Chinese Egyptologist, or not Egyptologist, but um, I guess kind of an Egyptologist, but it was more like pyramids in China, and she was telling me that there's thousands of pyramids, hun- at least hundreds of pyra- pyramids in ch- China. Have you ever had an opportunity to go to China and see these pyramids? Unfortunately, no. Oh. Some some 10, 12 years ago, I have tried, and I even received the visa, but you could only visit a few little points which were open uh, for the public. All the rest you could not see. And then it started to rain in, in exactly that region right. in China, and I could not go because of the rain. So I never was in China, but I know, I mean, the, the first Chinese emperor, they were coming from flying dragons down from the heaven to our mm. planet. Flying dragons, again, is a symbol for extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial spacecraft. And they say their first teacher, their first emperors, they all are kings of heaven. Still today, a Chinese emperor has in his, in his name the Tiang Tong. Tiang is heaven. Hmm. heaven. And it means not heaven, place of happiness. No, it means up in the firmament. Oh, my God. I, I Yeah, I was... I was hoping one day that they will open it up because I know she said a lot of the government won't let people get even close to the a lot of the pyramids, and it make that of course when they won't let you even close, it makes you wonder why. <laughs> um, I, I always ask my, myself this: why, why? Maybe it's it's a, a problem with religion. You know, if we definitely can prove to the world, yes, extraterrestrials were here, and yes, extraterrestrials promised to return in a far future. Mm-hmm. And yes, probably they are here again, you know, to speak about UFOs. We would have a shock. Our society is not prepared for that. We would think they they want to, to enslave us. They want <laughs> to take us over. We are afraid of them. We, we are not ready, the society. And you know, these extraterrestrials, they could not do something with, with, with millions of humans who are crazy, <laughs> who, who turn crazy. They, they need our help our work and whatever. Personally, I think that today we are visited by extraterrestrials. I know that some thousands of years ago they were here. I know they have promised to return. And this promise of return has become part of every mythology in every culture worldwide until today in every great religion. I am educated as a Christian. We are told in Christianity one day Jesus will return. Mm-hmm. But the Muslim society says, no, one day Mahadi will return. Or the great Jewish community will say, no, one day the Messiah will return. Now, etc. this goes on. Now, obviously, not every religion can be right. Some of right. them must be wrong. And or, I'm afraid they are all wrong. Neither Jesus or Mahadi or Messiah or whatever will return. Simply extraterrestrials. They promised it in the deep past, and they have return in present time well this this time of uh, the interview usually i reach out to my co-host on the chat room and i hope you don't mind if i ask a couple questions from your fans and and people that listen to the show um so uh let's see there was one i saw here uh, it's smile away that's his title says um uh oh yeah is Eric familiar with Mario Biglini, Biglino's work? And if so, what does he think of his theory? Mario Biglino is a brilliant theology, theologian, and he has worked in the library of the Vatican for decades. And he has come up with, to my knowledge, with two books in which he clearly says some of the translations of the Old Testaments are wrong because they definitely, in the Bible, in the first book of Moses, they speak about extraterrestrials who descended from the sky. Mm. So, yes, I am familiar with his writings, and he's a brilliant professor. I'm not too familiar with him. I'm going to have to look into that. Um, uh, I love, I love, uh, you know, a lot of people listen to a lot of people's theories and see what they they think. So, um, well, Eric, I know with, when when you started writing this book and you wanted to honor your friend, um, and people started. Uh, asking more questions about this particular um, discovery, um, what was it like to to hear those stories from your friend? Because you know we sit around the fi- campfire sometimes, or sit at home, or listening to our family 
tell the stories. But what was it like to to get to to interact with your friend and and hear his story? I mean, that must have been very uh, exciting just to to be able to hear like that uh, that tale that your you know your grandpa used to tell you about the the fishing trip. You know, I had my silly ideas about extraterrestrials already in college. Right. <laughs> I, had, I, I had doubts in my, my Catholic uh, religion, and I simply, I, I am a deep believer in God still today, by the way. Right. I am one of these figures who still pray. All through, I have, I cannot understand what God is. It doesn't matter. So I had doubts in my own religion because my God does not need the vehicle in which to move around from mm-hmm. point A to point B. My God is like a spiritual being. He's all over. Now, I don't go into the details. So I had these this, this discussions already in college and later, long before I published my first book. And of course, some of my friends loved me. They found it wonderful. Even some of the professors found my ideas wonderful. It was one of the professors who told me, Eric, go to the library of uh, the university at the place in Freiburg and ask for the book of Enoch. <laughs> so the discussion were going on before the publication of Chariots of the Gods. Then chariots of the gods come on the market. Of course, the official scientific community, they crashed it down. They said, this is all crazy. This is all nonsense. They said, first, we have no extraterrestrials. And if we would have ones, they would never look like us. They would be completely different. Hmm. Eric Podenikan writes of extraterrestrials who have a human form, which is ridiculous. And even if they would exist, they would never reach us because of the distance. This is the light years between these stars and our so all everyone was more or less against it including of course the archaeological and the theological uh, uh, society they said i interpret all this wrongly etc etc now you know the story <coughs> i continued <coughs> it's my car oh, no sorry <coughs> it's my type of character you know i'm uh, I'm like this. When I'm attacked, I defend. Right. I don't give yeah. up. I, I defend and I fight. <laughs> and I said to myself, it is true. There are uh, uh, m- m- wrong things in my book, Chariots of the Gods. There are a few mistakes which later turned out that they, have, they were not correct because I was misleading myself. I was believing to some professors or to some guides, etc. So I said to myself, the next book has to be better. And everything has to be clear. And the next, more better. Now, in the meantime, I have 43 books. And I always <laughs> say the newest book is the best of all of, the, all of them. Oh, yeah. No, every, every the, the latest uh, is always the best. But this one, I think, is it's fun. It's, again, it gets, you get to tell the story of your friend. Um, and the significance of ancient aliens, I mean, this, I think, for me, this was one of the biggest things that happened for ufology since sliced bread and what do you think ancient aliens how it changed society and the way they looked at ufos and aliens and the existence of extraterrestrials well i do not uh, agree with many things which come in ancient aliens because they uh, they mix sometimes things with which i'm not very happy with it Hollywood. on the other hand and on the other hand i'm very very happy that the series does exist because the series is made brilliantly, and uh, at least they force us to think about, are we alone? Have we all these things in the past uh, uh, interpreted in the correct side? So I'm very, very happy about the series. All true, I'm not happy with every detail, but that's not necessary. <laughs> so Ancient Aliens helps. It goes worldwide. And you know, when they started, some roughly 12 years ago, they wanted simply to have two or three continuations. In the meantime, it's over 160 continuations. That's more than the X-Files. Right. <laughs> and I think anything, I always tell people, you have to be careful when Hollywood gets involved because they want people to continue to watch and they want to add a little flair to it, you know, put a little lipstick on it and uh, they want, you know, make it look even better than the actual story. But I just think for me the the importance, not only that it brought, you but it brought a lot of other people's theories to the table to where it made it more normal where most people you said oh i saw an alien or a ufo and they they think you're crazy but now people 
at least are ready to hear some stories and, and get a little bit more involved in the conversation. So I, full, I fully agree with you. That's that's why the, the series is important. And, you know, it goes worldwide, especially the German speaking world, like in Switzerland or in Germany, in Austria. We are the most stubborn of all it. <laughs> we think of UFOs and extraterrestrials. Right. That's all garbage. That's all nonsense. And since ancient aliens is on, on, on screen, we, we really think it over. We have become more tolerant in the meantime. And I and I do appreciate you saying that, you know, in Chariots of the Gods, that, you know, not many people would uh, admit that they were wrong. And so I think I, that even adds more respect to you than, you know, a lot of people would would agree on. So so thank you for doing that. Uh, real quick question. Well, we have, um, uh, first of all, uh, Smile said, thank you for your work, Eric. Uh, what do you think aliens would want us to know if they could speak to us directly? They would want us to know that we are not alone in the universe, that the universe is full of intelligent life, that we are part of it. They want us to know that there are different forms of life, but also the same form as we. We are the offsprings of them. As the old holy writings say, the gods created humans according to their own image. So they would teach us, yes, you are humans. You have grown up on this planet, but by the with the help of others. Your evolution was not only so pure as your evolutionist says, Somebody always interfered, inter interfered, excuse my English, That's <laughs> into, into your evolution. So we are the product, not only of evolution, but also of the help of extraterrestrials. We are part of a family, of a gigantic family out there. And probably they would also tell us, we don't know what God is, but be, a, a, be a, a humble, humble against the spirit of universe and accept we do not know everything. One thing that I found interesting in this latest book, you you said that um, you feel that the uh, Egypt is filled with is a is a huge library, or the Pyramid of Giza is, is nothing but a huge library uh, created for the people of the future. But why why did they sometimes make it so difficult to find, um, or or was it? one of those things right under our nose type of situation. <laughs> no, they made it so difficult to find correctly because they wanted to avoid that the wrong generation ah. would open these buildings. You know, if they would have, if you would just have big entrance into the Great Pyramid, you have halls and, and, and you know, corridors you can work in. Then maybe 400 or 500 years in the past, somebody would just enter it. Hmm. And they would find objects or books. They would not understand it. They were destroyed. So they made it complicated. They knew exactly only a, f a far future society, which has the technology with electronics, and with robot, can discover these rooms. That was made on purpose. I mean, I mean, it is proven that in a lot of human beings, we, we find something. Look how many uh, temples or pyramids have been looted uh, and you know, sold just for profit. It wasn't to preserve history. It was just more for money. So, yeah, you're absolutely correct on that. <laughs> um, well, Glenn was asking, are are we interdimensional with these aliens that uh, created um, Egypt or helped create Egypt? Well, well, definitely. The first rulers of Egypt were extraterrestrials. That's not Eric von Derrick who say that's the old writers, the old historians who say they, the first rulers came from space and they ruled over Egypt. Only later, human and half human uh, uh, beings ruled over Egypt. And you know, the first rulers in Egypt, they had these elongated heads. You find these elongated heads all on, on, on in, in Egypt. You know, all the pictures, all, all the, the, the sculptors, mm -hmm. the, yeah, the, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so you find them with these first dynasties, the first three, four dynasties, they all had these elongated heads because they were not human heads. They came from from out there. So they knew that the first gods were extraterrestrials. Well, I... I and first... by the way, to interrupt, 
you know, the first god, the first god of ancient is Osiris. Osiris is the same as Orion. Oh, his really? Wife, yeah, his wife Isis is the same as Sirius. Hmm. So Orion and Sirius. And in the meantime, there are quite the uh, people like uh, Robert Choch or, or, or Mr. Boval who say the three pyramids uh, have the the, the 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 form, not the form, the the thing of of the star belt of Orion. Well, in fact, I, I'm going to interview uh, Robert Schock later today, so I'm excited about that too. Um, but uh, you know, I, I have to say, you're you're a legend. You're you're a a treasure. There we go. You're a treasure, not only of wealth, but just uh, your passion for. Uh, not only of wealth. I'm not a rich man. Forget no, it. I'm talking about a wealth of knowledge. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> that's what I meant to say. Sorry if that was misinterpretation. But no, you're you're a wealth of knowledge, but you're a treasure uh, for this this world. And when it comes to the ufology and just preserving our our history, and I think it's very important because a lot of people don't want. Our history to be known so thank you for what you do i really appreciate it thank you thank you for the interview you and of course person. go ahead yes no you are a brilliant person it's oh. a pleasure to talk to you oh thank and, you, you know when i have speeches somewhere in the world normally it's always overcrowded which says to me there is an interest oh yeah not only in the figure but in what, what i have to say what i have to show in the meantime, we have this problem worldwide with Corona, which is terrible. You know, uh, oh, yeah. you cannot have full rooms anymore, full halls. Right. It's a catastrophe. So, and I, I suffer. Since two years, I had only a few public uh, uh, lectures. That's a shame. Before the two years, you had over 250 lectures a year. <laughs> That's what I said. I couldn't believe. I, I'm tired just thinking about it, but uh, you, you don't ever seem to be t tired. So congratulations on that. Um, well, people can get your book um, on Amazon. You can go to uh, danikin.com. Uh, Is there any other places uh, you can pick up the book? And also, where, are you going to be speaking uh, anytime soon or any? <laughs> no. Not, not, not to my knowledge, because of this uh, <laughs> yeah. COVID. Because this COVID. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor to have you on the show. You're always welcome here, and I'm, I'm sure your next ten books are going to be amazing. And I can't wait to have you back for to talk about those. <laughs> you know, one thing is sure: this planet was visited by beings from outer space thousands of years ago, and there is one person who can prove it. And that's me. No, it's like I said, I bowed to you when <laughs> you came you, on. Thank you. So, Eric, okay. thank you so much and take care of yourself, okay? Okay, bye bye. Thank bye you. bye now. And everybody, thank you for tuning in. You guys were great. Thank you for the questions. And uh, please always be a part of Truth Be Told. Share this show. We want to, you know, honor our guest today, uh, the, the legendary Eric Von Denigan. Thank you so much. We'll be back soon for Robert This Shaw. has been another episode of Truth Be Told. Thank you so much for watching. Recorded live at UBN Go Studios in Burbank, California. Join us on social media. Facebook, Truth Be Told Radio. Instagram, Truth Be Told Paranormal. Go to Truth Be Told Worldwide for more information on upcoming shows. This...